weird circle. In this cave by the restless sea, we are met to call from out the past stories strange and weird. Bellkeeper, toll the bell so all may know we are gathered again in the weird circle. Welcome to the Ogden's Playhouse for another Weird Circle story. Tonight, we are to hear a classic mystery tale from the pen of Elizabeth Gaskell. This is an unusual story in every sense of the word, just as Ogden's fine cut is an unusual tobacco on every count. Ask the smoker who rolls his own cigarettes with Ogden's. There's an unusually fine taste and aroma to Ogden's. Try Ogden's and sample its goodness for yourself. You'll find Ogden's easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. And now tonight's Weird Circle story, The Old Nurse's Tale, by Elizabeth Gaskell. Out of the past... Phantoms of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale, the old nurse's story. Hear that? That tapping on the window pane? Yes, I know. Tonight it's the wind knocking the apple tree branches against the glass. But long ago, we in the big house heard that rapping. And it was not sound made by wind, nor by any mortal means. I, Hester, have been nurse for many years to this house of Thurnvale. I spend my days remembering, remembering and reliving the past. I recall how Miss Maud and her sister, Miss Grace were the prettiest young ladies in this countryside. Their father, Lord Fernvale, paid little attention to the motherless girls. So wrapped up was he in music, which was his hobby. And so, when he invited Tony Sorrento, a fine young musician, into the house as his guest, Lord Fernvale was blind to the court Mr. Tony paid to both the sisters. I remember like it was yesterday, for I was only in the next room sewing. I remember when Miss Maud turned on Miss Grace. Look here, Grace. Somebody's got to wake you up. You're acting awfully silly with Tony. You're positively moon-eyed. Oh, am I? Anyway, I don't giggle at the least thing Tony says the way you do. Grace. Oh, Maud, let's not quarrel. I, I, I've wanted to tell you something for a long time, but I, I've been afraid you'd laugh. Promise me you won't laugh. I couldn't laugh looking at your serious face. What is it, little sister? I'm just terribly in love, Maudie. And Father's going to have a fit, but, but I can't help it. I, I'm just awfully in love with Tony. Oh, Grace, this will never do. Tony, why, Tony's no good. Don't say that. Don't say it. And if there's anything you know, don't tell me because... because it's too late. Grace! Oh, it's oh, Father. Where are you? Please don't tell him anything, Mom. Please. Girls! Girls, where are you? Here, Father, in the library. It's a wonder you wouldn't answer before I yell my lungs out. Maybe you two are ashamed to face me. Oh, I know what's been going on around here. Nothing. Nothing's been going on, Father. We don't even know what you're talking about. Oh, don't you? Well, the whole town knows. And neither of you seem to care if our name is subject for the back fence gossips. Get to the point, Father. What have you heard? It's public knowledge that my guest, Tony Sorrento, has been courting both my girls, setting two sisters against each other. And you... You silly, stupid girls without pride or dignity, permit this trifling nobody, this this musical dandy to make sport of you. Don't talk that way about Tony. He hasn't been courting both of us. I suppose, Grace, you think you're his heart's desire. Father, don't be cruel. But Grace, father's right. Tony has been making love to both of us. Don't tell me. I won't listen. I don't believe You've it. You've got to believe it, you little fool. Anyway, I have sent Tony packing bag and baggage. You'll never see him again. You... You what? Where is he? Where did he go? You've got to tell me. I've got to go Grace, to him. Grace, Grace, use, use your head. Oh, listen to me, both of you. 
Tony and I were married yesterday. Married? That cheap fortune hunter married to my daughter? I'll not have him joined to our family. But, Father, I'm his wife and your daughter. And he is your son in spite of you. Oh, in spite of me, indeed. Not if I renounce you as my daughter. Get out. Get out. Get out of my house. And don't ever come back. If death had taken Miss Grace away, we in the house couldn't have mourned her more sincerely. Soon Miss Maud married, and we believed it was to get away from the gloomy place and from her father rather than for love. Lord Fernvale's temper turned more hard and bitter after that, lashing out at nothing at all. And then, one winter evening, after Miss Grace had been gone about six years, I was at the big house visiting in the kitchen when my husband rushed in, telling us Miss Grace had come back and was at that moment standing at the front door. With her was a pretty little girl. We tiptoed, for we were only human, you understand. We tiptoed to the hall door to listen. But Lord Fernvale's voice would have reached us anywhere. We heard Miss Grace say, Father, I've come back. Let's both of us forget our grievances. You must be mistaken, young lady. I am not your father. I have one daughter living. Her name is Maud. Another daughter, Grace, died six years ago. But I didn't die, Father. I am Grace. And this is Angelita, your granddaughter. Mommy, I'm cold. We'll be warmed up in a moment, dear. I have no granddaughter. And only one daughter alive who married suitably and well. You've come to the wrong house, young woman. Oh, Father, you haven't changed at all. But if you don't care about me, think about Angelita, your granddaughter. Mommy. Look at her, Father. She looks just like you. I'm awful cold, Mommy. I'm not interested in a child, nor in you. You must not persist in this madness that I am your father. I tell you, my daughter Grace is dead. All right, Father, if that's the way you want it. But don't forget I'm your daughter. And I, too, can be hard and revengeful and mean. And I swear to you, I'll hurt you some way. Somehow, I won't rest until I make you suffer. I'll make you suffer. You'd better hurry to the village. You may be in time to catch the late train. Good night. We all stood like stones, so frozen we were by what we'd heard. It was a cruel night for a woman and a child to be walking to the village. For there was a bitter wind rising, and snow was beginning to fall. My husband wanted to sneak out the back way and find Miss Grace and the little one, and hide them in this cottage here. But the master must have guessed our intentions, for he called us in and gave us all tasks to do, just to keep us busy and thwart our plans. When we'd finished, we thought Miss Grace and her child had surely reached the train by that time. But in the morning... As I walked across the back hillside pasture where the sheep graze, Timothy, the shepherd, called. Hester! Hester! Come, come here! Quick! What in goodness name is it, Tim? Here! Look! Look behind the pine tree! Uh, against the rocks! Oh, merciful heaven! It's Miss Grace and the little one! Frozen like statues! I heard about them coming to the big house. They, they must have got off the road and got lost in the blinding snow last night. Oh, Timothy, it's awful to see them sitting there. I, I can just imagine how Miss Grace and the little one groped their way up the hillside and thought they'd take shelter behind the pine tree against the rock. Oh, the poor lost things. Mind you, Hester, how the big rock is just like a stone chair for her and the little one. Well, maybe their souls have peace and rest now. I wonder. I wonder after all that's happened and the way they died. I wonder if their souls will ever find rest. We never knew how the master felt about the tragedy, but it was plain to all he was a softer man after that. Though, whether it was the death of Grace and the child, or good news that came within the week, or both together that changed him, it's hard to say. For Maud gave the house of Fernvale an heir, the master Robert. Lord Fernvale was fairly bursting with happiness and pride. He couldn't do enough for the boy. Lady Maud often brought Master Robert to visit at the house, 
and we all agreed he was an uncommonly fine, bright boy. We'd nearly forgotten the tragedies of the past, but we were soon to be reminded of them with awful clearness. When Master Robert was going on six years old, Lord Fernvale sent word to my cottage for me to come to the house and see him. Mr. My daughter Maud and her son Robert are coming to stay several months this winter with me. Her husband has business in the Far East. I would like you to act as nurse to the boy. Oh, sir, I'd be very pleased. Master Robert's such a sweet child. Robert's the only heir to carry on our family name. I want you to take very good care of him. Oh, indeed. I shall care for Master Robert like he was my own son. Mr. I'm an old man. I... I want peace now. I want Maud to be happy here. She's never been told about the death of Grace and the child Angelita. We Fernvales are not very forgiving. I can't say how Maud would react if she knew the circumstances under which her sister and niece died, but what's past is past, and I can't change it now, Hester. I want you to promise me you won't ever speak of Grace and of past events. Please don't say another word, sir. You can be sure I won't speak of what's none of my business. How could I know that this would soon become very much my business and that I would be tempted to break my solemn word to the master? Indeed, we were all so happy the first few days Lady Maud and young Robert were with us that it hardly seemed possible our household had ever been anything but happy. And then one day... I was playing a game with Robert on the library floor and his mother sat knitting and smiling at us when we heard a tapping, a light tapping on the window. I doubt Robert's mother or I would have noticed the sound, but Robert dropped his toy and looked toward the window. Mommy, I bet that little girl's come to play again. Oh, I can't see her very plain. Little girl? I didn't know there were any children around here. Oh, there aren't any, ma'am. There's not even a house within three miles of us. Yes, that's true. What, what little girl would be walking three miles in the snow just to see you, Robert? I don't know her name yet, but I've seen her most every day. She stands outside the window and knocks like that till I notice her. And then when I go out, I can't find her anywhere. There. You hear that? You just wait. In a minute you can see her. You'll see her plain. But if she's knocking on the window, why can't we see her now? I don't know. She comes and goes. Just just like a shadow. What what does a little girl look like, Robert? Oh, she's just a girl. She's awful cold, though. She just shivers and shivers. There. There she is. See her, Mommy? Hester, look. Well, friends, as Elizabeth Gaskell's absorbing story unfolds, we shall see that young Master Robert seems headed for an undeserved fate because of his grandfather's unreasoning cruelty. We shall see, too, that the appearance of the little girl at the window is only the beginning of a chain of events of startling nature. But now, let's talk of the chain of events that lead to complete smoking satisfaction if you roll your own cigarettes. The first step is a visit to your tobacconist and the purchase of the handy green package labeled Ogden's Fine Cut. From there, the process is a smooth series of adventures in smoking enjoyment for the roll-your-own cigarette smoker. Just try the rich goodness of Ogden's. It's roll-your-own smoking satisfaction at its best. See how uniformly Ogden's rolls into a cigarette of fine consistency, a superior smoke every time. The popularity of Ogden's has been attained with good reason. For Ogden's is your guarantee of consistent, high quality. Try Ogden's. You'll find Ogden's easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. And now back to our story. Grace Fernvale enraged her father by an unsuitable marriage. When she returns with her five-year-old daughter, Angelita, Lord Fernvale insists Grace is dead and refuses to let them enter. Grace screams that somehow she will make her father suffer. 
The following morning, the bodies of Grace and the child are found in the back pasture, frozen like statues. Lord Fernvale's other daughter, Maud, has married, and her small son, Robert, is loved by his grandfather. Robert tells of the shadowy figure of a little girl he sees outside the window who beckons him to come to her. Maud, Robert, and his nurse hear the tapping on the window, but only Robert can see the little girl. see anyone, Robert. Where, where do you see her, Robert? Where is she standing? Right there. Right smack in front of the window. Oh, Mommy, I want to go out and bring her in so she can get warm by the fire. All right, Robert. Bring the little girl in. Oh, ma'am, don't let him go out there, please. Can't you see? There's no little girl outside the window. There is, too. Hester, I'm going to prove to Robert that the little girl he thinks he sees is imaginary. Now, run along, Robert. Put on your coat and go bring in that cold, shivering little girl. Saints preserve us, ma'am. Now I'm sure of what I'm sure of. What are you sure of, Hester? Oh, I can't tell you, ma'am. That's what I thought. Hester, the people around this countryside believe there's a ghost up every chimney. I was half frightened out of my life by the ghost stories I heard when I was a child. Now, I don't want Robert to believe those old superstitions. But how do you account for the knocking, those taps? I can't account for them right at this moment, but if I took the trouble to investigate, I'm sure I'd find some logical, reasonable explanation. Well, if you'll excuse me, ma'am, I, I want to run out and see that Robert's all right. Wait a minute, Hester. I'll go with you. We'll all three of us look for that little girl. Robert's mother and I got outside the house quickly, and we followed Robert's little footprints in the snow to outside the library window. His mother said... Well, here are just Robert's footprints. There are no others anywhere around. That's how I thought it would be. Calm now, Hester. Don't make a mystery out of nothing. You see, Robert's footprints lead around to the back of the house. He's probably gone to the kitchen to beg a sweet from the cook. Yes, ma'am, I see. But I think I'll follow on around if you don't mind. I think I do mind. I don't like the fear and hysteria in your voice. Robert will sense it, and then he really will imagine he's seeing things. Go in the house, Hester. I'll get Robert. It seemed hours I waited in the house. I remember I went from room to room, pressing my face against each window, looking, looking for Robert. I could hear his mother calling, first softly with confidence, then louder and louder. Finally, I knew she was frantic and afraid. I thought of Grace's last words to her father. I won't rest till I make you suffer. I'll make you suffer. Cold fear like pincers clutched my heart as I thought of little Robert, the only heir to the family of Fernvale, and how through him terrible vengeance could be wrought. Finally, I heard the front door slam and voices in the hall. Father, father. Hmm? What's wrong, Maud? Father, I can't find Robert. I followed his footsteps to the back of the house, but then I lost them. So many people had been walking there. Oh, now, calm I... yourself, Maud. The boy can't have gone far. And, uh, where was Hester? Why wasn't she with him? Oh, it was my fault. All my fault. I wouldn't let her look for him. But call everybody now. Everybody. Get everyone out to look for Robert. I got ready as fast as I could and joined in the search. And I started straight for a certain place I knew so well. For I had notions of my own about where Robert could be found. But I'd only gone a few steps when Lord Fernvale saw me and called. Hester... Esther, where are you going? To the back pasture, sir. Uh, wait a minute. I'll come along. Uh, why would Robert wander over to this rocky, lonely place? I I don't think Robert wandered alone, sir. Uh, what do you mean, Hester? D don't ask me, sir. You'll think I'm crazy. Uh, wasn't it here somewhere that Timothy found Grace and her child, Angelita? Yes, it was. We've only a few steps more to the pine tree in that rock that's shaped like a chair. Oh, come on, sir. Uh, Hester, do you believe that... Curses and threats can be effective after death? I don't know, sir. There's some who claim they've known of such things, but I'm sure I don't know. Around this way, sir. Around the tree. Yes, yes. Oh, 
Oh, there he is. Oh, little Robert. Look at him. Sleeping. Sleeping on the very rock that's like a chair. Uh, great heavens, is he alive? Is he, is he breathing? Mommy. Mommy. Oh, he's alive. So cold. So cold. Here, here. I'll wrap him in my coat. I brought a blanket. Esther. Here we are, Maud. Come around the big pine tree. Oh. We, we found Robert. Oh, thank heaven. Oh, how did he get here of all places? And what's happened to him? Oh, he's unconscious. Auntie Grace. Oh. Auntie Grace. Where's Aunt Juita? Aunt Grace. My sister. Why, Robert didn't even know he had an Aunt Grace. And who's Angelita? Pay no attention. He's a bit delirious. It, it's just a strange dream. Yes. A very strange dream. Esther, run ahead and get the doctor. For days and nights, we fought for Robert's life. In his delirium, Robert kept up a running conversation with Aunt Grace and Cousin Angelita. First with one and then the other. And Lady Maud asked me so many questions which I dared not answer, or I'd promised the master. We took turns sitting by the bed, and as I sat alone one night with Robert, I thought what a terrible power hatred is. For I had no doubt but that Robert had been led to the stone chair where the bodies of Grace and Angelita had been found, and that he had been led there through the hatred and vengeance of Grace and then I thought, doesn't love, too, have power? Indeed, aren't we taught that love is greater than hatred? In fact, greater than all else. And then I said aloud, Grace, Grace, don't hurt Robert. He's never harmed you. Let the child go. Let go of your hatred. What's done is done. Forgiving is a happier way than hating. Listen to me, Grace. Forgiving is a happier way than hating. And true as I'm sitting here, from that night on, Robert turned for the better. In a few weeks, he was up and about, his bright little self playing again. And I was not surprised when soon after Robert's recovery, his mother came here to the cottage to see me. Hester. I've heard rumors and whisperings at the house, and I've overheard things in the village. I know something about my sister Grace has been kept from me. I want you to tell me what it is. I thought you'd asked me that before long, but I promised your father never to speak of it. What's past is past. Why not let it be? Because I think I have a right to know. Strange things have happened, and I won't understand them. Now, why not ask my father to release you from the promise of keeping silent? Will you give me your word to hold no grudges? No matter what you hear, will you promise to be forgiving? Yes, Esther. I promise. Then I'll go back to the big house with you and speak to your father. I'll get my coat. Esther, do you notice there's a strange light in this room? A red glow. Oh, ma'am. Look. Look out the window. <gasps> There's fire in the big house. It's the reflection oh. we see. Robert. Robert's in the house. Oh, come on, Hester, quickly. We must save Robert. We must. We must. We ran as fast as we could across the snow-covered lawns to the big house. But by the time we got there, it was a mass of shooting fire. It seemed to me that if anyone were inside, he could never get out alive. In front of the big house, men were trying to hold someone back. It was Lord Fernvale struggling desperately. Let me go, you fools! No. Let me go, I tell you! Oh. Hold on now, sir. It's hopeless, sir. No, it's Robert. Robert's inside. I've got to go. Let me go. Father! Father, it's no use! Nobody oh. can stop me! Oh. Let go of me, you fools! Oh. oh, heaven help him! There he goes! That's the end. The end of this house. Yes, the house crumbled and fell, burning to the ground. 
and the head of the proud family of Fernvale died with it, for he had rushed in to save Robert and had perished there. We thought Robert had perished too, but as we stood there, fairly paralyzed with grief and shock, we heard Robert's voice. Mommy! Oh. Mommy! Robert! Robert! Oh, oh. child! Oh. I can't believe my eyes! You're not real! Sure I'm real! Oh, oh Angelita isn't real! She told me she isn't! She couldn't even light the fire! What, what do you mean? What do you mean, to light the fire? Oh, she came to the window again, and I asked her in to get warm. But the fire was out, so I tried to make a big light in the fireplace with papers and things. Go on, go on, child. Then what happened? Well, Angelita said she wasn't real, and she couldn't help me. So I did it all by myself. But, Mommy, some way your shawl that was on the chair by the fireplace got a burn on it, oh. and then the shawl lit up the curtain... And just everything began to burn. What did you do? How did you get out? Oh, I wanted to stay and see it. But Angelita made me run. We got out through the French windows and ran up the hillside where Angelita's mommy lives in the snow. And Hester, Auntie Grace said I was to come back and tell you something. Robert, your Aunt Grace doesn't live anywhere near here. Dear, you mustn't make up stories like that. Let him tell it, ma'am. Let him tell it. Well, Auntie Grace said she's sorry for what happened, and she says she doesn't hate anybody any longer. What is Robert talking about, Hester? We'll have a talk later, ma'am. I guess now this family can live in peace without fear of vengeance and old hatreds. Oh, yes. Auntie said I must never forget some words she said, I must remember that uh, forgiving is a happier way than hating. Oh, Robert. <laughs> From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought to you the old nurse's story. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Life has many an unexpected surprise. The touching climax in tonight's presentation at the Ogden's Playhouse is an excellent example. So, too, is the pleasant surprise awaiting smokers who roll their cigarettes with Ogden's fine-cut tobacco for the first time. It's a surprise that means smoking satisfaction. What's more, it's a happy surprise you can enjoy with every cigarette rolled with Ogden's fine-cut tobacco. Try a package. You'll find Ogden's easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Next week at this time, another Weird Circle mystery play, The Middle Toe of the Right Foot by Ambrose Bierce. Join us, won't you? If you smoke a pipe, try Ogden's Cut Plug. It's a cool, fragrant smoke. It's a delight in a pipe. <laughs> 